It's a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Welcome to Robin Minds. My name is Hero Daniels, and I am back as your guest host. I'm particularly excited today because the past week has been very interesting. We have seen politicians seeking re-elections, doing the most to woo voters. Uh, governors are paying pension arrears. Uh, we have a particular state of assembly member buying transformers after you know, building a low budget toilet for four years. Um, there's a viral video of a governor giving handshakes to his members after church. You know, I love this energy. That is what the Nigerian people really want. But the big question is, are political godfathers becoming less powerful? Think about it. Uh, the current politicians beginning to understand that people are now gravitating towards competence, capacity, as opposed to regular party politics. That is what we're going to kick off the conversation with, capacity versus party politics. And uh, joining me from Abuja to discuss this is Dr. Toby Oluwatola, who is the executive director CJID and also a policy analyst. Welcome to the show, Dr. Toby. Hero, glad to be here. All right, what's really happening? Uh, we've, we've seen a very huge bridge between the people in power and the electorates, you know. There's a lot of communication going on. And is this just because these politicians are seeking re-elections, or is there a massive shift in the political space in Nigeria? Thank you, Hiro. I think young people have to be proud of what we achieved two weeks ago. Because for the first time, I think, in my lifetime, people actually have a sense of agency in our uh, democracy. 100%, the election wasn't perfect. But we had about six or seven um, governors trying to go into the Senate, lose their seats. We had several uh, uh, the, the presidential um, um, candidates of the, AP, of the ruling party you know, losing in his own state and losing in um, the state of the president, losing in the state of several of his, his, his key supporters. And the reason that that is happening is because I was at the polling unit um, to vote and people vo not only voted, but they waited till like midnight to see the votes counted and the votes uploaded. Um, yes, granted, in many cases, the vote uploads couldn't work, but it is clear that for the first time, we're seeing people have a sense of agency. And the APC losing in Lagos is creating, uh, it's very entertaining what's happening in Lagos. You know, how uh, the incumbent governor is working really hard to woo voters because for the first time, there's a real chance that the votes of the people may count. And if that happens, he may in fact lose his seat. So it's, it's a very exciting time for our democracy. We, have, we, have, we had a case, cases where really racks to riches stories of people who are winning um, federal House of Assembly seats um, from being Okada riders and, and so on and so forth. So it's a really exciting time in our democracy. And I think we should be proud of what we've achieved so far. Uh, but even more hopeful, it doesn't mean that we should, um, we should reduce our expectations or our vigilance. We should be hopeful for what's to come on Saturday. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I was having a conversation with a friend and then he was like, at this rate, if you invite any sitting governor in Nigeria for your grandmother's burial, he will show up. You know, he will take <laughs> selfie with the casket. Hashtag adieu mama, vote for me come March 18th. Um, and the friend happens to be in the studio, Dan the Humorous, who is a satirist. Welcome to the show. How you doing, my man? Good to see you. I'm all right. Um, <laughs> nice attire. Yeah. Okay. What's really going on? <laughs> no, nothing. You know, I'm just trying to be in the zone. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, can you explain this movement that is really happening? And mm. where can we trace it to? Um, I think um, it's as a result of continuous awareness of the people. 
you know, over time for, you know, maybe some of us young folk who have been about this whole political business from, say, over a decade, you know, there are times you go into conversation with people and be like, ah, don't worry yourself, I beg, once I have food, I have shelter, I have this and that, I'm good. Whatever they are doing is their business. So it's like, but they've come to the realization that it's an us against them. And if we always keep it at that, it will remain that way. So we have to step in as a people. Therefore, you see constant awareness. And it grows with every election cycle. And I think this is one point that it got to a very um, significant tipping point, hence that massive participation. And you won't also forget that, to an extent, the middle class have been hit by the realities of certain consequences of actions of government or policies of government, as the case may be. You know? And really, the, 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 the middle class forms the real... Uh, um, uh, how like which one like the spinal cord? Let me if I can use that as of society, you know, because the rich have always been rich, the poor have always been poor. It's the middle class that always decides things. And then when you see all the economic realities and everything happening to the middle class, it brings them to a point of realization to say what's going on, and then they find out what's going on, and then they say to themselves, it's time to step up, you know, and step up to the plate and, you know, actively participate in the whole. Um, um, civic business of um, voting and electioneering going on. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, well, something bothers me. There's this. So the topic is capacity versus party politics, mm. and we've seen politicians with capacity in a particular party, but we cannot necessarily vouch for the capacity of other members of the party. So what do you have to say about this voting? A particular party from top to bottom mentality. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's something that we shouldn't even be discussing at this point in time because the way the Nigerian political space is, we're not like maybe the Americas or some other places that you say, oh, this party they believe in so and so kind of things. They believe in so and so kind of thing. In Nigeria here, um, uh, what's it called? Political parties are basically vehicles platforms that give you the opportunity, you know, to campaign for votes or to go about your political uh, um, ambition, as the case may be, or even rise to governance if you win. So we as a people should at this point, and I think we have also caught, got that part, caught that part a little bit with um, the aftermath of the presidential elections a few weeks ago. So coming down now to the governorship and House of Assembly in front of us, we should actually um, divorce the parties from the people because some of the people that made some people vote certain places if those candidates were or that candidate were in another party with another name those the result would still have been the same right so we should learn how to look at the candidates for who they are who is this man who is this woman what is he capable of and and all of that and of course that whole top to bottom i mean we see a practical demonstration where um, Aisha Yusufu, you know, I mean, she was all over the place out there for the Labour Party presidential candidate. And lo and behold, we're hearing now that for a state like Enugu, she's rooting for the candidate of Abga because maybe she has, you know, a better knowledge of him and believes in his capacity, as you know, as you capture in your, in your topic here. So, of course, people should go beyond that um, thinking that, oh, it is party A, therefore it's party A. Because we must even say that some of the people that they believed in, some people already had tickets in that party before the person they believed in came. So how sure are we that those people who are already ticket holders believe in the same ideology that their man, right. you know, uh, 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 believed in? So, I mean, like in my home state, River State, for example, you see where you have a plethora of candidates 60-70% of them are people that um, government has paid their bills for at least the last two decades. And then against one person that you see that has, you know, global exposure, national acclaim, local appeal. I'm talking about someone like Tony Cole, right? And then people are saying, ah, you're a good guy. But mm, the party, I'm like, is it the party that we govern you? For right. four or eight years as the case may be. So we really should, you know, step out of that. All right, that's on foot of thoughts. Uh, Dr. Toby. So, something has always yes. uh, bothered me, and I'm sure it's not just me, a lot of Nigerians. What exactly are the roles of specific offices? Because we've had an issue where certain members of the assembly would say, it is not my job to provide X, Y, and Z. It is my job 
to monitor and ensure that XYZ project comes to my constituency. But the people of his constituency want to see a physical project. This is what this representative have done for the community. So let's, let's clarify this. Is there a stipulated role um, for House of Assembly members to personally conduct projects, or are they just supposed to attract projects to their constituency? That's a good question, Hero. I think that we should start from w defining clearly what the role of a legislator is. So at the federal level, it's the job of the federal legislator to make laws at the federal level and to ratify certain decisions of the executive when it has overwhelming significant impact on the people. So for example, the appointment of a CBN governor, of ministers, appointments of even electoral commissioners, that needs to be ratified by the um, legislature. In addition to that, the legislature also have a, a job to attract projects, yes, frankly, attract development to their, their areas, their, to their constituencies, and to speak for their constituencies when laws are being, are being written, when um, decisions are being taken, where what should be implemented, and things like that. Now, in Nigeria, because of the state of our development, we have created this um, extra, extra role for the legislature that we call constituency project, um, where there is a small budget that is available to the legislature to do projects directly um, through MDAs. So remember, so you have to recall that in the end, the legislature doesn't get this cash. The MDA gets the cash. So for example, if it's um, a, an electric, electrification project in a rural area, um, the money goes to the REA. And the legislature, legislature, I meant to say, can then direct the REA what, where within its constituency wants that project done, and and supervise, you know, the appointment of a contractor to do the project and and whatnot. And that's because um, we we operate a, a democracy where people really need to see that you're working. Um, and then that's why that, that's been created. So, so there, there's a room, there's a role for citizens to uh, en enforce or ensure that there's accountability on what legislators do with their constituency budget. And, and, and that's really where, where, that, where that comes in. But I want to comment on something, the question that you asked earlier about capacity versus political parties. I think it's, it's true that political parties, a lot of people are simply voting blindly down the line once they've chosen a political party to support. Now, that has both a blessing and a curse. The blessing is that, or two blessings I would say, two pros I would say, is that one pro is that now whoever you are voting at the top has some supporters ostensibly down the ballot. If they, those those um, down the ballot people don't cross carpets after they get into office. But ostensibly, they ha it now has some supporters down the ballot. But it also creates a, a situation where you now are voting a lot of people, like there are a number of states where the Labour Party tickets were sold in blocks. So, a, so one person got X, X number of tickets and he just handed them out willy-nilly to his friends. So you, you now ha are creating new power blocks that you, we are not even aware of. So that's one risk that we also face. But on the flip side of that is that we now also have one collateral blessing, which is that we now have increasing representation. Because someone may say that someone who's coming from being an Okada rider does not have capacity to be a legislator, says who? There are many Okada riders in the country. They need representation. 
so, so in a sense, that also creates, in, that representation that we have created is also a blessing. So it's not, so yes, capacity is important and we have institutes like the Nigerian Institutes of Legislative Studies to build capacity once this legislators get into office. But at the same time, we also, we as voters okay. ought to be vigilant and pay attention to who we are voting for. Sorry to interject. Um, in all of this, there's something that we can take into cognizance, which is the fact that accountability is becoming a thing. Um, Nigerians are demanding for accountability, you know, both uh, with the electionary process and also with governance. How do you think this energy that we've brought into the elections can translate into holding our leaders accountable post-elections? I'm, I'm glad you asked that question, Hiro. I think there are many parts of our constitution that many Nigerians uh, need to go learn. Um, like I'm, I'm, I'm sure that many of us don't know that we have the power to recall elected officials. And, uh, and if you just go read the constitution, um, there, are, there, 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 there is um, through a, a, a majority of some sort, you can, we, can, we have the power of recall. Um, I'm hoping that as now that people are more awake, we can start to go look at those things and those options that are available to us. In addition to that, I think the media plays a very important role working with other accountability mechanisms of our democracy, like the judiciary, like the legislature, legislature quite frankly, as well as the law enforcement um, sector. And we, we ought to work together to and insist on open data. As people are getting into office, we need to insist that they, are, they be transparent and tell the people what's going on. And then have the people, the civil society, work with people to make sure that we are keeping people on their toes. Okay, and Dr. we're Toby. using those vehicles of accountability to get things done. Thank you very much, Dr. Toby. Uh, Dan the Humorous, we barely have two minutes. You're a satirist. What do you, I want to be very direct right now, yeah. and this is not against anybody, right? Um, but we've had a conversation on social media where a particular politician uh, said some things uh, during the NSAS protest. Mm. And people are saying that if he likes, he should buy one billion transformers. Mm -hmm. They're going to vote for the other candidates, not because they think the other candidate is more competent, yeah. but just because they want to have this as some sort of revenge vote yes. for that particular candidate. What do you have to say about that? Um, actually, revenge vote is a thing, you know. Um, you're even talking about some candidates who bought transformers. There is also a governor that was um, seen like a hero of some sort, and then um, he was accused of certain sharp practices in the presidential elections. And there are tons of people who have said, wow, so this guy could do this. I was going to support the guy who was, support, he was, going, he was nominating for governorship. I'm going to vote against. So yeah. there is a thing like revenge voting, and it comes from um, perception. As a public office holder, perception is key. How people see you, how they perceive you, how they you know, love you and all of that. And as a result of this person's action you mentioned now, is, if, like you said, it's not we can, we can even put AC in our ear, let everywhere be chilling. But they have said that we will vote against you. That one now is a case of perception. That means that for everybody, and comes, coming back to accountability that you talked about, for anybody that has the privilege of occupying public office, you must work circumspectly to ensure that every step of the way, what you are doing is in tandem with the feelings of the people, is aligning with the aspirations. All right. Hence, you have good perception. It helps you a lot because if they zero you, you're in problem. Uh, like uh, the robots will say, Oti Law <laughs> is gone. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show, Dan. Thank you, Hero. And of course, a big thank you to Dr. Toby Oluwatola. Thank you for gracing this program. All right. Uh, that's it for this segment. When we come back, Robin Mind continues. Stay with us. Welcome back to Robin Minds. 
And uh, if you were, before we went on break, we had such an interesting conversation about party politics versus competence. And uh, if you're a foodie like me, you would definitely enjoy this segment. I, I, I don't know why people would always say that uh, the place of a woman is in the kitchen. My father makes the best obono soup. And if you ever want to compete with me, when it comes to making a goosey soup, I will floor you hands down. So we're going to talk about <laughs> this very important topic is food, is cooking a gender role? And with me in the studio, I have professionals, professional chefs. <laughs> I have the very incredible Chef Gibbs. Welcome to the show. Hi. And of course, the CEO of My Food by Hilda, Hilda Bassi. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. It's good to be here. Anytime. <laughs> so I'm going to start from the man. I mean, they say ladies first. Well, yeah. Oh, it was oh, International yeah. Women's Day yes. a couple of days back. But part of breaking that bias is not always saying ladies first. So it could be a gentleman first okay. mm -hmm. or a lady first. So the gentleman first. Is cooking a gender role? Okay. Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, um, I am the vice president of the Culinary Aspiration Association of Nigeria, right? And in the association, we work with a lot of women, a lot of men. And when people come to us and they're asking a lot of questions for internships, for like um, programs that they can do, culinary schools and stuff, you, you, you tend to see a gender shift. Like, okay, normally you think that it would be all women or all men, but it's not, it's not like that anymore. Like nowadays, it's equal. Everyone is coming to the table. Everyone wants to cook. Like the passion for cooking is, 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 is so captivating now that it's, it's across, across all genders. And right. you see great people like Ilda, for example, and you see influencing stars on, on social media, men and women doing marvelous things. And at that moment, you definitely cannot stereotype anymore. It's, it's, it's all over. Like, everyone is having fun in the kitchen now. Absolutely. So, Hilda, My Food by Hilda, you've had such an incredible journey yeah. um, as a cook. The last time I checked, you were a presenter, and then before I knew what's happening on social media, you're cooking. Today's jollof rice, uh, tomorrow is fried rice, making us I mean... hungry. Uh, what was that transition for you? Um, like. So I'd say cooking is something that I've always done. And even when I was a presenter, I still hosted cooking segments. I hosted a cooking segment on a breakfast show. I hosted my own cooking show. So some way, somehow, despite the fact that I had, you know, the talent or let's like say the capacity to be a presenter, the part of me that is, you know, the cook and the chef didn't go away. So I just sort of married both of them together. But along the line, I transitioned into like full time, yeah. like cooking. Yeah. With, with your lifestyle, I'm, I'm yeah. on social media. I'm just like, is cooking that lucrative? <laughs> no, really, tell us. Give us the numbers. We need to ask. What am I doing with my life? I know. <laughs> You're putting me on this spot. No, Ilda, tell us. But Give us how lucrative is this so food business? I think, um, I think um, for the longest time, going by what um, Chef Gibbs said as well, when we started out growing up, it was like when our mothers were teaching us to cook, it was more about to, to sustain the home. They never really took the time to sort of explain that, you know, you can make money from this thing. For me, I saw my mother make money from cooking. My mother trained us, mm. you know, from her cooking business. And, you know, somewhere along the line, I'm not also going to lie to you, I also saw that ah, there's money in this thing. Do you understand? <laughs> Just like while I was at it. But it also stems from the fact that there was a, there was a desire to leave a certain way and I knew that okay this is what God has placed in my hands as well so I need to find a way to you know make this as profitable as possible so I had to see that it was possible to actually make money from it and then find the ways that I can make money from it and then start so I think when people get into the cooking business there's so many things that they just start mm. and then they don't understand you know pricing or costing and if you're not costing effectively there's no way you're going to be making profit so your business might be sustainable right. but then it's not profitable so there's no growth and that's one of the things i teach when yeah. i teach my classes as well it's important to understand that you're in the business to make money people are so scared to let their clients know that oh i'm cooking for you and i have to be paid like i have to make a profit from this right. so they are just trying to cook but yeah. that's not how it works yeah. you're not doing them a favor and they're not doing you a favor you're providing a service and mm. just as a presenter or a doctor or you know um, a lawyer needs to get paid you also need to get paid your work absolutely as well. you see how much of a businesswoman she is no she is she's talked about she 
she's, so she's going to make money from teaching. She's going to make money from posting on social yeah. media. She's now going to make money from selling the food. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Chef Gibbs, yes. beyond cooking for survival and cooking for fun. For some people, cooking is an art form. And this is an art form that is celebrated globally. Um, how much of storytelling is found in cooking and how can we sort of utilize these amazing dishes we have and export it as our own African stories to the rest of the world? Amazing, amazing. You know, cooking, cooking, so um, for a long time, you no, know, you don't mention about um, cooking um, with our parents and how cooking has been like a cultural transfer. And so you know, recipes from your mom, from your grandma, and things like that. So cooking is is not just a, a career path. It's not just a, a mistake for some people. They stumbled on it. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's, it's a story. It's, it's, it's personalized. Like a, a great chef. There's a difference between like a good cook and a great chef. If you see a great chef present a plate to you, you almost cry because there's a bit of nostalgia, there's a bit of themselves in it. And you want to, you're, you want to be moved to ask that question, please, why did you make this? And then they start, like when I was young, I was exposed to this ingredient. This ingredient meant so much to me and it made me want to do this, want to do that. There's, there's one of the biggest restaurants in, in, in the world that um, is heavy on foraging. So it's called Farm to Fork. So um, they grow their, 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 their ingredients themselves. They, everything, before you can book in that restaurant, you have to book like two years ahead mm. because everything is so specific, so seasonal, like fresh ingredients. And, and that's what we're even trying to promote in the association. For example, right. that Nigeria has so many beautiful... And that's one of the reasons I actually like Ilda. I've told her this before because... Um, Exporting our ingredients, using our ingredients. You no, know, a lot of people look at our ingredients and they just think, oh, it's local, local, local. There's nothing beautiful that can come from it. But there are a lot of chefs in Nigeria today that are doing amazing things with our ingredients. We did a podcast recently with yeah. um, um, Uba. Um, 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 Bambara. It's called Bambara. Mm. And in France, in in the UK. Um, Nigerians look for Bambara and when they like give it to their friends and so they're like, oh, this is a beautiful... And when you do a lot of research on it, you see the medicinal effect mm. of this thing. So foreigners are now coming here to ask questions about these ingredients. Wow. And so this is a time, this, this time that we're in right now is such a beautiful time to right. be a chef, to be a food professional in Nigeria because there's so much to tell. We, we will take them to our villages and show them this is where we grow it. Yes. Even though sometimes we don't even know where they grow these things, but <laughs> we're so, it's so exciting right now right. to love food, to be in the food industry. Oh, I, I am I'm excited by your excitement. <laughs> uh, but please, I have just one request. You know, you, had, you made a statement that, you know, this one restaurant that you have to book two years ahead <laughs> to taste their food. I beg no dwell. <laughs> I cannot wait two years to taste the food. We don't even know that will be our life, but yeah, you get the point. So Hilda, um, yeah. on, a, on a more serious note, mm -hmm. there's this conversation, an argument that uh, there, there are a lot of male chefs dominating mm. the industry. And some women would argue that this one area, this one field that we've owned for several years, yeah. you men, have left other phases, <laughs> other spheres to come and drag it with us. How would you react to that argument? Um, so I always say this, that there's enough space <laughs> in the sky for us all to fly. You know, I wouldn't say that men are coming to take over what we've already held down for the longest time. Like I said, Back in the day when they were teaching us to hold down the kitchen, they were teaching it to us like, you know, to hold down your home. Mm. Men really go into it as professionals. I think that has been the thing. So maybe mm. before now, or long before now, um, women weren't taking, you know, the title, the chef title as a, a thing. It was more, I'm, I'm a great cook, I'm a homemaker. I used to champion the, oh, I'm not a chef, I'm a cook. You understand mm. me? So it's, it's more that men sort of, put it in the more like, you know, took the profession of it and now made it a whole thing. And then they are now, you know men, they can make noise when they start something. <laughs> we're good at branding. Okay. We're good. You, see, you said it already, we're professionals. Something, something that we've been doing, you know, for years and we've been doing it effortlessly. Uh -huh. Men will now just come and own the fire, maybe because their own is going like this. They will start, it's called flambe. Well, exactly. I'm guilty. I, I remember this one time I was frying onions. I had to put it on snap. Husband material one time. Yeah. So I think it's just more, I feel like now in this space that we are, we need to be more proud and vocal yes, about what we're doing. There's yes. nothing about cooking that is small. There's right. nothing about being a chef that is small. Mm. Whether you're a female chef or a male chef, you need to own it. Is you that why you're to... doing the cooking? 
I mean, that's one of the reasons why. Is you know, but you need to own it. You need to. You need to be loud and proud about it because the truth of the matter is, we know a popular musician that, like, he drums his name in your ear, like, he's the greatest, he's the great. You need to let people yeah, know that right. what you're doing is not small. Even if one million people are doing it, Absolutely. there's something special about you, right. and there's a difference. So, don't let it be you say, oh, men are... No, men are not doing anything. <laughs> not Nobody <laughs> can come and take it. Hero, yeah. Hero, if you can, if you allow me to just add yeah, a little sure, bit to sure. that. So, um... I, I'll, I'll tell you this. History has actually favored men in this industry. I, 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 and I'll explain. I'm not, I'm not being ahead, biased here. So, um, like she said, women have always cooked because it was a duty. Mm -hmm. So, it was almost like you're a woman, you should know how to cook. It was almost, that was what culture preached, right? Mm -hmm. And so men that, that found themselves in that space um, were in that space as far, they were probably paid to do it or it was an instruction, it was, it was, it was maybe it was, you were a slave extra, or something, it was, it, was, it was work, right? And so even in the history of culinary arts, so I've done a little bit of history of, of culinary arts, men actually started the industry, right? And, and, they were, and women were not allowed to work professionally. And this was not even a, a culinary thing, it was the general thing. You look at other industries as well, you see where women, there's certain spaces where women were not allowed to, to work at, at the same level with men, or not allowed to speak. So those things are being broken. It's not, it's, it's still, and the reason why you're asking this question is because we still see those, um, those yeah. um, situations yeah. happen even in this day and age. Mm -hmm. okay. But thankfully for successful male chefs, successful female chefs, right. they're breaking those stereotypes. And yeah. I'm, I'm so excited that... that I'm, I'm, I'm excited as well. Hilda, what's next for you? Very so, quickly, what's the next project? <laughs> Just piggybacking on what he said, like the, I'm currently or in the process of attempting to break an existing Guinness World Record. Woo! You know, so while setting the record in Nigeria, because it's never been done here before. And the woman that is currently holding the record now, um, a chef from India, was the first woman to actually break that record. Like, long before now, it's been men, right. men, men. But then we're now, out of time. you know, <laughs> Hilda right. is going to be breaking awesome, the record. Awesome, awesome, uh, awesome. We're looking awesome. forward to that. Thank awesome. you so much. <laughs> thank, you, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, Robin Mind continues after this break. I'll reserve some food for you, so don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back. This is Robin Minds. We've been having such a great time uh, from our two segments, and this is the final segment. And this is the segment where we celebrate women. Happy International Women's Day in Arias to all the beautiful, strong women in the world. It has been said that once you empower a woman, you empower an entire generation. Um, however, there are certain concerns that we have, uh, concerns about gender equality. As we speak, only 34 women in 31 countries are currently head of states, and the UN projects that it would take women about 130 years to bridge that gap so that there's an equal representation of both men and women on, 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 on such a global scale. Uh, so yeah, that's what we want to talk about today. IWD 2023, is there a win for women at the polling booth? To discuss this with me, I have a very astute politician, the one and the only Asiwaju Kesi Sheung Adedamola. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, so let's jump right into it. Um, right, how would you rate women's performance in the last election? Uh, I would like to answer a different question because I don't think it's a function of their performances. Right. It's a function of how has, what is the enabling environment? Because I'm an active politician, I can tell you for free that the environment is not very friendly to women. It, it, it's as if they only, you know, there's a song we like to sing that, you know, we sing it in Europe, that when it's time to gather the votes, you remember that we have the bulk of the votes because we can influence our husbands, we can influence our children, and we can influence people, the community. But when it is time to get reward in terms of appointment and political um, office, we, we, we don't get as much. So I think that in terms of the enabling environment for a female politician to thrive in our climate, we're not doing very well on it. And it takes, we have to be intentional. It's not just going to happen. So let me give you an example. I'm married with children. And then you fix a meeting consecutively for 1 a.m. If my husband goes out at 1 a.m., chances are like, I'm like, okay, boys, hang out or whatever. If I wake up my husband consistently that I'm going out at 1 a.m., what does it speak about me? So mm. some of these, you know, they, I think there has to be intentionality, you know, to think about the woman, to realize and remember. I mean, 
it, we just have to be intentional about it. Right. Speaking about intentionality, I'm aware that some parties would say that we're going to zone 40% of the seats to women, or we're going to zone a certain percentage for women. Uh, sometimes they will say, oh, for the, for the forms, the forms will be free or discounted for women. Um, do you think those things are sort of helping, or do we need to address a deeper, deeply rooted issue to sort of empower women more? Okay, so I think that the first point, the first place to start is gratitude for the leader that you have. So I contested in the primaries in my state, Ogun State, and we were asked to pay half of our nomination form. You know, so that's encouraging, and we're very thankful for that. Uh, but beyond that, the truth of the matter is that there is deep rooted. I think saying that we're going to give a slot to women, the first question is, do we see through? Or does it only sound good on paper? Most often than not, it only sounds good on paper. We don't see it through. By the time you look for a woman, you can't find a woman, you say, you know what, why are we bothering ourselves? We need to drive deeper and not only say, you know, my this is the right thing to do, because it is the right thing to do. You of know? course. And a lot of people have been saying that maybe Nigeria will become one dollar to one naira when we have a female, a female president. I would really love to see so, that. So yeah, I would. I, I hope in my lifetime I get to see that. So I think we should. We need to, um, as I've said, be more intentional. Some of these things that we're saying, we need to put our, you know, we need to put our money where our mouth is. We need our men to drive it. We need them to make. I'm not saying we want to earn it because we know that we can do it. But I think that there are some extenuating circumstances that is not allowing it to be done well, and we would appreciate more effort in that regard. I don't know if. If that uh, yeah, of course it does. Um, so we're, now we're talking about the political parties. Now let's talk about the electorates. Right. Um, we can't deny the fact that there's a level of, permit me to use the word maybe misogyny, mm -hmm. right? That is deeply and rooted in their mindset. You know, um, they will naturally gravitate towards a man as yeah. opposed to a woman. So, how do you think we can be able to sort of, as a society, start correcting those um, misogynistic? mindsets amongst the electorates? I think that, you see, one of the agencies that I actually like, but is, I consider it to be grossly underutilized, is the Nigerian Orientation Agency. I remember, I don't know if you can, when we were growing up and there was this campaign about a civil servant can have only four children. You see that a certain demography, almost all the children around that time were, were just four in their family. One My of parents. four. One because there was a conscious, you know, it was there was there was another one. They call it fetus. Some of it, they said it in Yoruba, they said it in English. At the point, it was just acceptable that you can't have more than four children. Now, you are correct that, and I have had instances in which I'm in the car with my driver, and everybody is saying, "Well, hello, sir," to my driver, and I'm there sitting down. Do you understand? Because that is how we're very patriarchal. Um, so to come back to your question, I think that we all have a role to play. I think that the, the social media, the media, we have to make a conscious effort, even in parenting. It, it's something that it's across every sphere of life. In our churches, you see some churches that you can't be a minister if you're not a man, you know. And so what does that say? Does it mean that the only people that God can use are men? It says something to the subconscious of the congregation. It says something to the subconscious of the people. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right. So it has to be, um, I would say, a community-wide effort. And we must start it yeah. as parents. It starts in the home. You are not inferior to your brother. You know. So I have a son and a daughter. Whatever my daughter does, my son does. He needs to realize and understand that the fact that you're a man does not make you a superior entity to your sister. You are different, but you are equal. So we must propagate that gospel. We are different, we are wired differently, but it does not make one less than the other. So yes, to answer your question, it has to be nationwide, it has to be a concerted effort an intentional effort to speak to that. But it's, not, it's, a, it's a long walk to freedom. It's right. not going to come easy. Right. But, you know, we'll start somewhere. Right. Um, taking a cue from what you just said, you mentioned the family. And uh, the family is the basic unit of the society. Right? The family is the basic unit of the society. So once we get things right with the family, hopefully we can get things right with our society. And... Uh,
if we look at the family system critically, you would see that leadership position in the family is almost clearly defined, that the man is the head of the home. Absolutely. I like what you said that um, you tell your son and daughter that both of you are different, but nobody is bigger than the other. Now, taking it to the parents, the father and the mother, how can we define the leadership to be different but equal? Well... It's like, you know, there's this thing, if they carry me where I don't go, I don't know. If they carry me go where I don't know, you know. But you see, it's, it's in, in that context. What I see and how I define it and how it works for me is I say that my husband has the casting vote. So in the board, for example, you want to make a decision and it's, uh, say, 50-50. And then there's one person that gets to, you know, Get one extra vote just because he's the chairman of the board. However, an individual does not make the board. He just so happened to be the chairman. I'm a Christian, and I'm quite uh, conservative and traditional. And I believe the Bible that says clearly, the husband is the head of the house. In that context, there's, there is no way around it. it is, I appreciate that. I honor that. And, but it doesn't mean that I'm less of a partnership in that relationship. It right. just means that when we get to a tie, I realize that I don't get a casting vote. So that's how I, I like to prism it, prism it. So, you know, and it, we function effectively that way. All right, so <laughs> we're almost getting there. We have some elected female officials in, yes. in, in this current dispensation. Right. Um, how much responsibility do you think they have, owing to the fact that they are the representatives of not just the entire nation, but also women in particular, and their performance and how they perform in that particular office can also sort of open people's eyes to what a woman can do when given power. So how much of a responsibility do they have? Well, I, I don't think that they have any responsibility differently from the men. They're role models, and you know, I think that, well, perhaps it just behoves on them to, to, to make a conscious effort to show. So one of the things that I do is I try to tell young girls that there is nothing that you cannot achieve if you set your mind to it. And I got that from my father. So when you are doing well and you say that to a younger lady, because you have walked that path, it's easier for her to believe you and understand you, you know, because you are living the reality. So I don't think that they have any extra responsibility than to do well. However, they sh the only thing I would say is there's an extra added layer for them to consciously mentor the, the younger female folks. And we've had excellent women in Nigeria. And I used talking about, um, you know, the Dora Kiyuli. Are you talking about Gozi Kunjewala? I mean, are you talking about so many people, you know, so many women? We have strong women in Nigeria. I love them. I celebrate them. But we must do more to continue to inspire the younger ones that you can do it. If I can, right. so can you. All right. So now let's talk about generations, right? Um, the youngest generation is the Generation Z. Um, I don't know if you have a child or children in that category. But there's, there's some sort of pandemic um, happening with that generation and also the millennials as well. Um, there's certain values that seem to be changing. Um, okay, I'm, I'm trying as much as possible to put this in the best way that I can, um, but we now see a generation that you see that um, young girls, they aspire to be the best they can, right? So I don't want to generalize. Some of them aspire to be the best they can. But also you see some imbibing certain, certain qualities um, and high dependency uh, on, on men, you know, for certain resources. Um, I don't know if you get what I'm, I do. if you I do. get where I'm I going do. to. So how do you think we can sort of, you know, encourage the girl child that you are powerful, you are independent, and you are also equal? Uh, with with this man, and you should try as much as possible to be the best that you can. You know that is a very sensitive question, right. and I see that you're picking your words so that Extremely. you do not um, um, see, people do not hear what you have not said, because sometimes people hear what you didn't say. Right. Um, I think again, 
that at, at the heart of some of these behaviors is greed. And greed is the enemy of the heart. You know, what is enough? There is, in, there is no, never enough of anything, but you must be able to say, you know what, what, how far can I go for what I think that I need? Some of that is also, I have to go back, and parenting is so important. I cannot overemphasize it, all right? That is very important because I would not, for example, my nephew, you come home with a G-Wagon, you are, how? Where from? Or my niece? From where now? We are going to that. Me and you are going to the police station. So what about? And what about? There was something I was reading on social media just to underscore the importance of parenting about association of Yahoo Yahoo mothers, people who know that they, their children are Yahoo Yahoo and they have an association. What does that speak to? It speaks to defective parenting. Do you understand right. what I'm saying? But irrespective of what their parenting is, this is me saying to the girl child. What is in between your hairs are so powerful. You can be anything you can be. You can, you can earn everything that the man is earning without doing some of the things that you have. So believe in yourself and go for it. You're going to get it. On that note, I'd like to say a big thank you to you. And on behalf of the men, I would like to say that we respect, we honor women. Thank and you. women are such an incredible you, you guys are the, the the integral part of our society that without the women so the give, will, give us will. give us our 40 percent <laughs> yes give us our 40 percent <laughs> we'll give you your 40 percent thank you so very thank much you for, for having me program. grateful thank you thank you and that's what we have for you today i hope you enjoyed this episode of robbie minds uh, catch us next week same time same station my name is hero daniels bye for now we represent, hey, hey, G, e, oh.